All right, this is our video on, we're going to title it, Who is Israel? Because this is um, one of the biggest lies coming out of the apostate church. It's one of the most damaging lies as well. Um, this idea of replacement theology is what they push, and it's just completely botched. Um, if you don't understand that you must be grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel to be in the kingdom, you, uh, you just you end up getting a lot of bad doctrine. It's the foundation of the whole Bible, really. You have to understand this. It's a critical thing to understand. So we're going to take our time today and um, talk through a bunch of things like the history of Israel, the split, how it was prophesied to happen. Um, this is just going to be, you know, for complete beginners, right? Someone who has just woken up yesterday, picked up a Bible, wants to know who they are in prophecy, wants to know who they are, um, who they will be in the kingdom this is just we're going to take you through all of it um how to be grafted and what being grafted in means uh, what happens once you're grafted in how this is allowed to happen how you were divorced in the first place um so this video is more directed at um the northern kingdom of Israel and we're going to get into the two kingdoms but really it's di directed at um the lost stuck inside the apostate Christian churches uh, not so much directed at um, Judah, although, you know, it's all the same thing. It, it's one gospel for everyone. So um, even if you are in, you know, if you are a, uh, from Judah, then, you know, this this video is for you as well. But a lot of the stuff we're going to talk around, like Christmas and Easter and stuff, is um, more of a problem inside of the Christian church. Although, as actually, you know, I don't know if I can even say that because... Even the evil family of Judah is propagating Christmas today, so it, all of that might sound a bit foreign. But we're going to get in, we're going to go through everything, everything entirely. So to start off, you need to know some some basic sort of history of um, of Israel and of the two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. So originally, Israel was twelve tribes, right? So that's Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Dan. Uh, and then from those 12 tribes, that was a, that was a original Israel. Um, and then essentially a, a split happens. And you see this in, um, in, in the Book of Kings and, and through Chronicles and stuff as well. Um, very clearly that basically because of Solomon, um, the son of David, because of his disobedience to the covenant, and even more specifically, going after strange gods, Israel was split into two kingdoms, right? So Benjamin and Judah in the south, and the rest up the top, okay? So Benjamin and Judah, they have um, Jerusalem as their capital remaining, right? It's always been Jerusalem. The northern kingdom makes Samaria their capital, and um, these are two kingdoms or two houses, um, you know, you can hear them referred to as the house of Judah and the house of Israel, um, or the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The thing is, you know, it can be a bit confusing, right? Because we have Israel, which is originally all 12 tribes, and then the house of Israel, which is the 10 northern tribes. So when we say house of Israel, we're talking about the 10 northern tribes. And when we're talking, when we say house of Judah, we're talking about Judah in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Um... And basically what's going to happen is the two sticks are going to become one again um, and the kingdom will be restored, but we, we're going to get into all of that. All right? So the first thing you've got to know is that the split was always prophesied to happen. Um, the, first, the first place we see this is in Deuteronomy 4, verses 27 through to 31 more specifically. And now what I should say also is during this video, we're going to be reading passages. We're going to be reading verses out of chapters. Um, but it's so critical, especially when we start getting to, I mean, even all of the Deuteronomy scriptures, Hosea is so critical. You read the whole thing. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've taken out little verses, you know, passages. But when I say in Deuteronomy 4, verse 27 to 31, you should really go and read the whole chapter. And don't take our word for anything. It's, you know, you have to seek this out yourself and you have to see this yourself. Although what we're, we're telling only the truth in this video, there's not going to be a word of guile on any of our mouths. You can take all this for truth, but that's well and good. You shouldn't, even if you trust us in our message, you shouldn't. You should see it yourself because that's going to uh, solidify your faith and you can't please God unless you increase in faith. So you have to search this out yourself. So when I say Deuteronomy 4, 27 to 31, 
you should pause the video and go read Deuteronomy 4 or whatever way you want to do it. You can take notes and go back and read the scriptures later, but you have to read all these scriptures. It's very, very important. It's the only way it's going to become a part of your doctrine and become, you know, be written on your heart as if you read it yourself in God's word. So with that out of the way, this is where we see the first prophecy of uh, Israel being exiled into the promised land and then uh, out of the promised land, sorry, and then from there scattered to the four corners of the earth. Importantly, where they'll worship other gods. So verse 27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve other gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient to his voice, for the Lord God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. So you see, turning to the Lord thy God, means to be obedient to his voice and then we're even told in the very next verse in parentheses for the lord god is a merciful god so that's what your mercy is he's only merciful to those that are obedient to his covenant so you what's going to happen is the northern kingdom are going to get scattered and you know israel hearing of this at the time you know they would have been like what right you know they would have been like this this is a sad thing for them to hear but they were going to be scattered and they, when they're scattered they're going to serve other gods the works of men's hands wood and stone Okay, so what does that remind you of? Christmas trees, okay, the works of hands. You cut a tree out of the forest and deck it up with gold and silver. Even um, crucifixes scattered throughout the churches, the Easter Bunny, Halloween, these things, strange gods that your fathers didn't know. Um, so f from there we see that they're going to be scattered. We get an idea of perhaps why they're going to be, you know, the reason for the scattering or the exile. And, you know, we, we get that from verse 28 where we, we're told from there you're going to serve other gods. So that gives us a clue as to perhaps why they're going to be scattered. But then you keep reading. Uh, keep reading the book of Deuteronomy and you get to chapter 28. And uh, in verse 63 to 64, Moses <coughs> gives this prophecy again. The same he, he is this and it's in the same speech when he delivered the curses regarding uh, disobedience to the covenant so that's your context he says and it shall come to pass that as the lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you so the lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught and ye shall be plucked remember that word from off the land whither thou goest to possess it and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So same prophecy, this is delivered in amongst the, um, the curses that will come upon Israel for forsaking the covenant. Even later in chapter uh, 32, specifically I'm just going to read verse 36. God reminds us again of this prophecy, which will come to pass. 26. 26. Did it, what did I say? No, just, just to mention quickly, too, when it says your fathers, it's talking about like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, people yeah. way back then. It's not talking about like your literal father. Yeah, you're um, like obviously the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and stuff. So Exactly. Like uh, what are they? Some people call it your patriarchal fathers or something like that. Yeah. Abraham, yeah. Isaac, Jacob, uh, to who the promise was given in the first place. So, um, yeah, yeah sorry, uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 26, I don't know what I said. Um, he says, I said, I would scatter them into the corners. I would make them remem the remembrance of them to cease from among men. So this is important because here we're hearing that Israel is going to lose its identity, essentially. The yeah. remembrance of them is going to disappear no one's going to know oh you know i'm from gad i'm from naphtali i'm from zebul you know that's no one's going to know the the remembrance of them is going to cease um no one's you know because at the time everyone's israel's the greatest nation right you know they were just brought out of the land of egypt like you know and god's doing all these miracles for them israel's going to cease to be remembered we see the same thing this loss of identity in psalm 83 
verse 4, and this is um, speaking of the other nations, right? They have said, so the, the other nations, the Gentile nations have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So it's these, you know, God uses these Gentile nations to do his will, to fulfill his prophecy. Yeah. So this is another thing, and I'm not going to try. I'm going to try not to digress too hard throughout this video. But you know, throughout all the history of time, we've seen God using the other nations, the powers that be, to um, punish and discipline and chastise uh, yeah. God's people. So you don't, you know, you read Romans 13, you understand not to complain when these things happen. You know, uh, but that's a whole it's other video, isn't it? Yeah. It's worth mentioning as well, you know, when you kind of introduced the video and you were saying that this uh, this video is mainly directed at the northern kingdom, at the house of Israel. Um, but, you know, that it's it's worth a watch for those from the house of Judah as well. Well, in scripture, in prophecy, when it talks about how Judah is more treacherous than Israel, it's, it's partly because of um, that, the the name of Israel being taken out of the, the memory of people. And that's Judah's doing, you know, through the Talmud. We're going to get into this later in the video. But the reason why Judah is more treacherous than Israel is because they stole the inheritance yeah. from Israel. And that's that's part and part of uh, this, uh, the remembrance of Israel ceasing from men. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Um, and that's even we get we will get into that, especially around when we talk about the divorce of the northern kingdom and how they can be remarried through the death of the Messiah. Um, it's, you know, the evil family of Judah who don't understand, who don't believe in the Messiah, who deny Yeshua. Uh, and they, they think, OK, northern kingdom's been divorced. They can't come back. They don't let him back. You know, so it's going to you're probably going to uh, you're probably going to see later on. Right. You know, when because Israel is coming back. You know, the northern kingdom's coming back and you're going to see probably um, some resistance from that northern kingdom. But yeah, let's try to, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll get into that. I'm, I have to keep reminding myself not to digress. But um, yeah, that you're right, Matthew. Absolutely. Because, hey, man, like, you know, we, we could definitely just get into like the selfish husbandman in Matthew 21. And like, we could just digress big time, but let's just. Make this yeah. not a five-hour video. Yep. Yeah. So they're going to be cut off. Um, they're going to be scattered. They're going to lose their identity. And then this comes to pass in 722. I have heard 721. Um, it it sort of doesn't matter, although, yeah, we, we'll get, in, we get into that as well. But it's you know, around 722, um, the northern kingdom were exiled. You see this in Second Kings 17, um, verse 5 to 6. Um, and as a matter of fact, Second Kings 17, the whole chapter, that is an absolute must read. Because you have to Amen. absolutely understand why Israel was scattered in the first place. Because if you don't understand yeah. why Israel was scattered in the first place, exiled in the first place, and you go off and do the exact same stuff that Israel did to get scattered, then how can you expect to ever come back when you're doing the exact same thing that... Yeah. Uh, brought this punishment forth in the first place. Romans 11. Mm. Yeah. Speaks about this. Um, no. But specifically in verse 5 to 6 is, um, you know, the, the prophecy coming to pass. And remember, Samaria is the capital of uh, the northern kingdom. Uh, it says, Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria, northern kingdom, and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halah and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Medes? It's Medes, right? Medes. Medes, Medes and Persians okay. so are like Medes. So they get scattered into Assyria. Now, this is important. This isn't something you can just gloss over. Um, Assyria is the country that we call Turkey today. So actually what I've I'm going to pull this up. I don't think you brothers will be able to see this because I'm just uh, pulling up the photo now. But this is the exile, right? It's a bit blurry. Um, here's Northern Kingdom. They go into Assyria. And this is the country that we call Turkey today, right? So it's just northwest of the land of Israel. 
Um, and it's also important to know, which again we get into, but the Northern Kingdom never returned. So we'll get into the prophecy of that later, you know, and look at actual scripture, but for now just sort of, you know, take our word for it until we prove it to you. This is where they were scattered to initially, before being spread into the four corners of the earth, Assyria. So you would have had a lot of what what, we, what the Bible ends up calling like Gentile Israelites, um, you know, my people who are not my people in this in this area, right? It's called Asia Minor, Turkey, uh, and this is even where uh, what you know the seven churches of Revelation are. Okay, so I'll come back on to the screen now. Um, okay, so we see Israel scattered into Turkey, never to return, uh, or yet to return. And then we see also the exile of Judah, the southern kingdom. Um, and this is afterwards, okay, only the southern kingdom was left. In, uh, and you see this in Second Kings 17 again, in verse 18, just following on. It says, therefore the Lord was angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Okay, so you've got this period of time where Judah's still in the land. Israel aren't. Then in 605 BC, the first, what I would call, wave of Judah, uh, they get exiled into Babylon. And we see this in 2 Kings 24, 10, verse 10 to 16. I'll read it. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, and all the princes, and all the mighty men of valor, even ten thousand captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained, save the poorest sort of the people in the land. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wife, and his officers, and the mighty men of the land, those he carried into Sorry, those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even seven thousand, and craftsmen and smiths a thousand, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. So what you need to be sort of picking up here is that in this first wave of exile from, from the southern kingdom, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, takes just the mightiest men, of the southern kingdom right he wants to build his empire he takes the blacksmiths the the warriors what else does it say um, I, I mean you know that's really it, the royalty he and he leaves the poorest people in the land okay then we go to Daniel 1 uh, just the first four verses of that and we get even more detail it says in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. So that's lowercase, lowercase g. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay, so again, they take the scientists, the cunning in knowledge, and they teach them the learning of the Chaldeans and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So they teach them the ways of the Chaldeans, who are in Babylon, right? And this is, this is even your roots of where you get that evil Talmud from. It was written there uh, where Judah learnt the, learnt the ways of the Chaldeans, 
they learnt this um, polluted sunset to sunset Babylonian Sabbath. Okay, and a lot of bad tradition and doctrines come out of Babylon. And this even is why Yeshua was rebuking the Pharisees so hard. This is your context, right? This is why he was calling these people of their father the devil, dead men's bones, etc. Okay, because they, they, they began to worship the devil and they taught re the rest of Judah to do the same. Uh, and they blended it in with the, the ways of God. And you see, the, Chal the Chaldeans, they were already a rich nation, right? They, they were already prosperous. Um, and it's actually very interesting if you trace back their lineage. You, you can look into like history outside of the, the Bible and, and learn more about the Chaldeans, but you know, you, it's all you kind of take it with a grain of salt and just stick to Scripture. But you know, you, we can already tell even from Scripture that they were, you know, a powerful nation. I mean, they took over the Southern Kingdom, right? And then they take even more p cunning and skillful men out of Judah. And the Chaldeans, this line of this family line, they still even run the world today. Uh, we just, you know, this evil family of Judah, the Chaldeans, we just call them the Freemasons or the Illuminati or, you know, which is like the Oc Oculus cult, if you're familiar with that. But um, this, you've got to, it's really important to understand that Judah get, go exile into Babylon, learn the ways of the Chaldeans, and then they return. Okay. Um, we do get a second exile of Judah as well, where the, the rest are taken captive. And this happens in 586 BC, um, you, and you just can see. A, it. Just, sorry, Andrew. Just a quick note, like, you know, if anyone takes what Andrew's just said there and says, "Oh, you know, this is just a conspiracy theory thing," you know, when you actually look into the practices of the Freemasons, um, and you you look at the foundation that their uh, their practices are built on, it's it's built on Babylonian traditions. Uh, and, and Babylonian practices, and um, <clears throat> you know, to to just ignore that is a very foolish thing to do. You know, you you look at what the Babylonians used to practice, and you look at what the Freemasons used to practice, and it's it's identical. You know, they are they are they have carried these Babylonian traditions throughout all of the generations up until now, uh, and they still continue them. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, it's a good point. And I mean, also, you just got to have, you got to trust in God's word, right? Like he says that they learned the ways of the Chaldeans. So that's that, you know, it wasn't forgotten. We have no reason to assume that these ways of the Chaldeans were forgotten amongst that evil family in Judah. They might have morphed or changed, you know, just like a, an Asherah pole is now called a Christmas tree, but the roots have still come from Chaldea, Babylon. So the, 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 the second exile of Judah, 586 BC, you get a few accounts. So 2 Kings 25, um, I'll give you the verses too specifically, but again, I encourage everyone to read the entire chapters of these things, uh, at least the entire chapter, and in many cases, even the, the one that came before it and the one that follows it. But you know, 2 Kings 25, verse 8 to 12, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 to 21, and Jeremiah 52. Uh, verse 12 and four, two, two, 14. Um, so these are your accounts of the second exile. Um, for the sake of time in this video, we're just going to read one of them. Um, so this is in Chronicles um, chapter 36, verse 15. I'm going to read through to 21. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up bedtimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon the king of the Chaldees who slew the young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon the young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God great and small, and treasures of the house of the Lord, and treasures of the king, and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon, and they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword he carried away into Babylon, where, there was, where they were made servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. 
to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Okay, so two important details in here. Judah became servants to the Babylonians. And it was to be for a length of time given as until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Okay, so again, we see Judah becoming servants to Babylon for this length of time. Now, you've got to understand, right, there's a, a weekly Sabbath given by God, which is made for man, Isaiah 58. Um, this is the one in the Ten Commandments written on the tablets of stone by God's finger. And then there's a, um, you know, this is the weekly Sabbath is part of the Holy Covenant, which we're still under today. That's Exodus uh, 31, verse 16. Um, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout generations for a perpetual covenant. Okay, so that's the perpetual covenant, the holy covenant, weekly Sabbath, Saturday, beginning when the sun rises, not the Babylonian way, beginning when the sun sets on Friday, Saturday sunrise to Sunday sunrise. This is the, this is the Sabbath mentioned in Exodus 31. But there's also an annual Sabbath. Um, well, what I'm calling an annual Sabbath, right? And this is part of sacrificial law, Leviticus 25. Um, and it's, it's given by Moses, added because of transgression to the Ten Commandments. And you see that in Galatians 3.19. Sacrificial law is added because of transgression to the Ten Commandments until the refreshing of the Holy Covenant, which is when the Messiah comes and, and fulfills that. And so in this annual Sabbath, right, the land and the animals within there, uh, they gain rest for that entire year, every seven years. So this is the Sabbath that's being talked about. But, you know, you have, it's it's very likely that, you know, Judah weren't keeping the weekly Sabbath anyway. You know, parts, parts of them. Their main, um, you know, their main sin was idolatry, or, you know, spiritual adultery. But you've got to think that, you know, they're transgressing in all sorts of ways. But we, but we see that God says, basically, you won't keep my instructions. You won't listen to me. All right, off you go. I'll give the land the rest. Um, so that you know, this passage that we just read here, um, Second Chronicles uh, twenty-one. Uh, so yeah, thirty-six, chapter thirty-six, twenty-one, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. This is quoting, you know, that which Jeremiah already prophesied about in Jeremiah 25, verse 11 to 12. So three score and ten years is just um, 70 years. It's just the KJV language, right? And um, this is what Jeremiah prophesied. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall, sh shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. Okay, so Judah was always going to return. It was always, there was a time stamp. It was always going to be seventy years. Um, and that's the only reason that we have ethnic Jews in, in the country that we call Israel today, um, is because their ancestors returned. Um, now remember, they picked up that Talmud, and they still reckon with Babylonian day counting. You know, they still keep the Chaldeans' traditions. Um, but you know, then that, that's even why the Jews are renowned for their sort of belief in ethnic supremacy, right? Is because that's what their Talmud tells them. That anyone not an ethnic Jew is like under a cattle, I think it says. I think it uses cattle or maybe dogs. I don't know the Talmud, right? But I know it says that something along those lines. And basically, it says go ahead and abuse them, and you know. They're, you know, they're just, they have the same rights as, as dogs. Um, you know, so the thing is, right, that once they think that once they're in the kingdom, Gentiles will be their slaves. And, you know, but th this is the evil family of Judah who, who learned the Talmud, right? The Talmud was uh, this idea dreamed up by elders in, in the southern kingdom that, um, God gave an oral law to those at uh, Mount Sinai, aside from the sacrificial law that was written down. And then they had this oral law for a while, and then it, they, they write it down. And then you've got now you've got this book called the Talmud, and it's just complete lies. Um, came, came from Babylon. 
So you do have a remedy. And it's, it's easy enough to just it's easy enough to just go do some research on the internet and there's lots of people talking about it, like Ted Pike, for instance. You know, they talk about all these different verses in the Talmud that will just blow your mind. Like, what? Did they just really say that? Yeah. yeah. You know. And that's that's the thing as well. So um, we're told, you know, don't go to the left, don't go to the right. Stay on the middle path, on the narrow path. And, you know, for the Talmud has, the, the Talmud being on the right, uh, the left has a, an equally as ridiculous idea. You know, this once saved, always saved doctrine it's just as ridiculous you know the the talmud teaches these ethnic jews that you know just because of their ethnicity they don't have to they don't have to worry about anything they are god's people no matter what they do no matter the life they live because they're an ethnic ethnic jew they will be in the kingdom and that these gentiles are going to be the slaves and the christian church teaching once saved always saved there's actually people out there believe it or not there's pastors out there who will actually say you know if someone's a christian for a day and then they denounce god and they don't follow him anymore they'll still be saved because they were saved once and it's like how outrageous is that you know it, but it's it's just as ridiculous as this talmudic doctrine um you know the i guess the talmudic doctrine might seem a bit more uh, elitist you know but uh no yeah it's they're both just as wicked as each other amen and like if we go way back you know and look at uh second Kings 17 for instance like what was the great sin that they were doing you know um it was really the fact that the watchmen weren't doing their job mm -hmm. right because i mean they were just you know, building their little Asheroth poles outside the walls on, on the high places and stuff, and nobody was saying anything. Yeah. All right. So both sides, that's that's the issue. The yeah. watchmen have to get to work, right? Go rebuke the apostate church. Go rebuke the synagogues. Do your job. Yeah, it's exactly um and that's exactly it. Like if you if the watchman is that's exactly why we have to love our neighbors as ourselves, because if you if you just sit there quietly minding your own business you know, doing whatever, feeding your own belly, people sin, and then that blood's on your hands. Um, and yeah. we, we, I mean, this yeah. is something we say, this gets a mention in every video because it's, it's so important. I mean, the Messiah elevated this commandment, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's quoting Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. Um, you've got to do that. And even in, in Kings, the whole book of Kings, we see throughout the theme is that it was the kings that caused Israel to sin, you know? So how much more blood will be on their hands? Although Israel... The members thereof who do idolatry they you know and it, it, it's fornication right it's, it's it's adultery against god that's why even it says um you know god is a jealous god because who's you know if you've ever been cheated on that's a gut-wrenching feeling right it destroys lives and it's the same thing like it's the same thing that everyone does twice a year to god at least twice a year when they do christmas and easter you know Oh, but it's all right. I'm thinking about God when I'm doing it. It's like saying, oh, I'm going to cheat on my wife and have sex with another woman, but it's okay because I'm thinking about my wife while I do it, and it's her that I really love. It's so it's stupid. I mean, um, amen. Like, uh, idolatry is just spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the, the sin that leads thing. to death. And I mean, that's sort of to bring it back to what I was saying is that's, um, you know, although it was the kings that set up these altars to sin. Well, I, you know, sorry, I should say that set up these um these these altars these of uh, of, of Moloch and other gods, causing the Israelites to sin. The, the you know, they still it's the Israelites they get exiled, right? It's not just the kings. So they're still obviously accounted, um, you know, they're still accountable for their for their own sins. Um, but yeah, essentially, the, but what we should mention as well, there is a, a remnant of Judah. Who actually, you know, first, you know, first and foremost, know the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, and they know that their their brothers from the Northern Kingdom are scattered, and they're doing the royal law trying to get them back. I've heard accounts of this. You know, there are people there in Judah who know these things and are trying to get um, their brothers back, brothers and sisters back. And actually, there's certain sects of Judaism, uh, Judaism that know this and they pray for the northern kingdom as part of their doctrine like is it three or seven times a day or something and i mean you wonder how genuine that is because they still read that talmud you know so but you know the point i'm trying to make is that 
Judah know Israel is scattered, and some of them know they're coming back. And it's all in the Bible. We see this in, uh, so I'm just going to continue, but we see the return of Judah in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, in a few places, right? Specifically, Ezra 1, verse 1 to 4. Uh, Ezra 3, verse 1 to 3, Nehemiah 2, verse 17 and 18. Um, again, I'm just going to read one account for the sake of time and just for the sake of completeness so you can see that, yes, Judah do in fact come back in Scripture. Um, so this is Ezra 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is the God. Because remember, the, the, the temple was destroyed, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold, and with goods and with beasts, beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Um, so due to return, after that 70 years has been fulfilled, the house of Israel yet to return. Okay, there's no account of the northern kingdom returning in scripture, most importantly, but there's not even any sort of serious debate over this matter in, in the world in terms of, you know, from historians or anything. There's no evidence of a return, archaeological, archaeological or um, biblical alike, right? There's, um, it's, it's a universally accepted fact. You do a little bit of research and you actually see the Assyrians carried out a policy of, um, you know, forced population displacement as well. But more importantly, it's just not in the Bible, right? So we do see many scriptures telling us that in the time of Yeshua, at least, they were still scattered. And as a matter of fact, Yeshua tells us himself that he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's Matthew 15, 24, which I'll read. But that's so important to understand. This is out of the mouth of your Messiah. He only came. For the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He did not Amen. come for the Gentiles. And as a matter of fact, we're going to read an account uh, later. A, a Gentile woman comes up to him and he says, it's not good to feed the, um, you know, give the meat. to. The, it's not meat to, um, you know, give the food to the dogs or something. And we, we were going to read that. But, you know, um because there's more, that's a key scripture as well. But he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He did not come for the Christian church. He did not come for, um, you know, the uh, the Gentiles. You can't remain Gentiles. It's so crazy that the church insists on remaining Gentiles. No, we're Gentiles. That's not for us. We're the Gentiles. We've replaced Israel. We're the Gentiles. What? Messiah said, he, then Messiah didn't come for you. Then the, he's not your Messiah if you're Gentiles. Okay, it's very clear. Matthew fifteen twenty four, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there you go. You have to be part of the house of Israel. Or, you know, if, you, you know, if you're Judah, you'd be grafted in as well. But you have to be an Israelite to make it to the kingdom. It's that simple. Messiah said it very clearly, very plainly. So you have to, you can't form this doctrine around not being Israel. Because that's a very scary thing. Um, it's one of the most insane parts of the apostate Christian doctrine that I can even think of. Um, it just makes absolutely no sense. So, you know, don't worry, though. All right, we're going to read you know, around this verse. As I said, we're going to read the context later, and we'll see that anyone can be saved. It's got nothing to do with heritage. It's nothing to do with bloodline. It's nothing to do with um, I'm black, I'm white. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Asian. I'm from, I'm from Gad. I'm from, you know, whatever. It's, it's a spiritual Israel. You have to become part of the yeah. Commonwealth of Israel spiritually. Um, so you just yeah. now it's important that you just understand that yes, you only came for the scattered sheep of the house of Israel. But is it, if you've gotten up to this point in the video, hang on because it's about to get a whole lot more interesting. You know, it's about to, you, your mind will probably be blown if you've never seen this before. Yeah. Anyone got anything to um, add on that? 
Um, no, no, I think uh, we've we've covered everything okay. that we needed to. Um, Adam, I don't know if you want, do you want to do section two? Sure. I'm just going to okay. take my um, so hoodie two. off here. I'm getting quite warm. Okay, all right. You keep reading. I'm just okay. going to my camera for a second. Section two: Israel dispersed. The Jews knew that their brothers and sisters from the northern kingdom were lost. When Yeshua told the Jews that he was going someplace, they wouldn't be able to find him. We, of course, know that he was talking about the kingdom of God. But we see that they taught in John 7, 35, that per perhaps he was talking about going to the dispersed. Verse 35. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whether will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go on to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? And if you open, if you open Strong's Concordance on this verse, you'll see that the Gentiles just means nations, and the dispersed literally means scattered from the root word sown. And... Would it blow your mind to learn that the same word Paul and Peter used when they addressed when they addressed their letters um, is is uh, Strong's one two nine zero okay uh, definition a dispersion scattering abroad of seed by the sower hence dispersion Okay, and Ephesians 2, 11 to 12, very important verse here, verses. Whether we remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel means to be estranged, according to Strong's Concordance, which by default means that they were at one time part of the commonwealth of Israel, but by the time Paul was sent on to them, they had completely forgotten the Holy Covenant and had no hope because they were without God. It's important to note as well that it's covenants plural. You know, it's, uh, as we said in the last video, we're gonna, probably going to get around to doing a, a rainbow covenant video, but you've got the, the Holy Covenant, the covenant of promise, which was given, uh, promised Abraham and confirmed in Israel. Um, which was the Ten Commandments given at Horeb, and then the Rainbow Covenant is the to eat clean and don't touch the blood. But um, yeah, Paul is saying here that Israel were um, they were keeping the covenant of promise, not just singular, you know. So that's an important detail to to point out as well. Yeah. Also, Amen. So really quickly, just don't. I mean, go read uh, Leviticus chapter eleven. Right, mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. important thing to do: don't eat, don't eat bacon, don't eat pig, don't eat uh, any any um, bottom feeder fish that don't have scales. They have to have scales and gills to eat them. Don't yeah. eat sea bugs like uh, lobster and shrimp, and you know, don't eat clams. Yeah, yeah. you'll get an evil spirit. You know, and they they this this right. is for a reason. They carry carcinogens and things. And this is the, this is the Rainbow Covenant. I'll, I'll link my video to the two covenants in the description of this video so that people can go and watch that because we can't just talk about the two covenants too, in too much detail as, as you said yeah. and this will be like a 10 hour video but the thing i wanted to um point out is that it says um you know wherefore remember that ye being in times past gentiles in the flesh right so these the people paul was the talking to remember they were dispersed into the in, into assyria into turkey i'll just say and you know they they they've lost their identity right they have what did it say um not lost their identity they, they're not remembered same thing right um they're gentiles in the flesh because they you know they've inter they're people from the northern kingdom marry uh people from other nations and then you know you get a few generations down and all of a sudden you're a gentile in the flesh however you will mm -hmm. be grafted in and become israel in the spirit 
spiritual Islam. Amen. Um, so it's so important to understand the, the group that Paul was talking to even throughout all his letters. He's going to these areas where the northern kingdom were dispersed. So when he's talking to the Gentiles, he's talking to my, you know, my people who are not my people, the, the, um, you know, the, the lost, the lost from, uh, from Israel at one time. Yeah. And as well, just to focus on Ephesians 2 and 11 and 12, you know, you do actually have Christians out there say, oh, I'm not Israel, I'm a Gentile. And this scripture clearly says that when you are a Gentile, you are without God and without hope. Yeah. So, you know, like you, you don't want to be a Gentile, you know, like if you're following God, then as uh, Romans 11 talks about, you know, you, if you're grafted into Israel, you must be following the uh, the covenants because that is what sets Israel apart. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely don't want to be proclaiming that you are a Gentile and not part of Israel. Yeah. 100%. And it's, yeah, I didn't know if I should say this, but I will anyway. I mean, it, it's this, the whole apostate church, a lot of them have this thing of, uh, Jew worship mm. pretty much right like they're god's chosen people you know but they don't realize that they're israel right they have no idea yep okay um section 2.3 in the document here my people which were not my people the divorce so when paul says in romans 9:24 that he was called, that he has called the Jews and Gen and the Gentiles. He's saying Judah and the house of Israel who were dispersed into the Gentiles and therefore are now called simply Gentiles. Verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. Okay, so moreover, let's see what, what uh, he was quoting in Hosea 1, chapters 1, or, yeah, verses 1 to 11. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Sublium, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Judah, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Verse 5. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Laborium, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. And I will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Laborman, Labor, sorry, Laborma, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, call his name L Lami, for for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, 
which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. See, it's clear. God will call those who were not his people because they were, they were divorced. His people again. Okay, so see, it's clear. God will call those who were not his people, his people again. Or as Hosea puts it, the sons of the living God. The only people who were his people prophesied to one day be his people again are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Amen. Yeah, we see this all the way through uh, prophecy. You know what? We are going to get to this, and I know we keep saying this, we're going to get to it, but it's it's so hard to uh, to restrain yourself when you have these thoughts. But, like, you know, all the way through prophecy, God is telling you that he's going to gather his people again. Gather them, gather them, gather them. And he's speaking about bringing Israel from the four corners of the earth back to the land that he gave them. Um. So we're on to section three here, um, which kind of backs up what Adam was just saying here, that it's only only Israel will be saved. There is no uh, Christian church as well as Israel. It is only Israel that will be saved. So <clears throat> only the only gates to heaven, the gates of the kingdom, um, are those with the names of the 12 tribes on them. So John saw uh, the, the kingdom in, in Revelation, and he saw 12 gates, and these 12 gates had the names of the 12 tribes. So this is Revelation 21, verses 10 and 13. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he shewed me that great city, the kingdom, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, <clears throat> and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. So there is no Christian church gate. There is no uh, Gentile gate. It is the, you know, it's it's the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, yeah, there's a, we're going to, we're going to include the, um, this document in, in the description of the video, but there's a, there's a video from uh, our brother Mark who explains this in more detail, uh, which is very much worth watching. Um, and so now we move on to the white stone. And um, the white stone is one of the spiritual blessings that um, Yeshua promises to give to the bond servants if they uh, remain in obedience and do the work that he gives them to do, which is loving God and loving your neighbor. Um, entering the work of the prophets, being a watchman, all of these different idioms, all pointing back to the same thing. Uh, and yeah, so this this white stone that he gives you is is it's the name of the tribe that you have been grafted into, the, the spiritual tribe that you are from, which is the gate that you you know you would be entering in through that gate uh, into the kingdom. So Revelation 2, verses 16 and 17 says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. So to overcome means to, to finish the race, to continue in the work and to um to go right to the end. You know, you don't want to you don't want to fall away and fall to the cares of the world. Uh, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So a hidden manna, um, the meaning of hidden manna is its prophecy. So uh, just to quickly digress a little bit, in the, um, in the Ark of the Covenant, I think it's in Hebrews that Paul talks, uh, whoever wrote Hebrews talks about this, that within the Ark of the Covenant is the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod of authority, and a golden pot with manna. And these are the three things that should be in the bond servant's heart. The Ten Commandments, the royal law, Aaron's staff of authority, and the golden pot of manna, hidden manna, prophecy. Um, and only the people who receive the Holy Spirit of truth are going to understand prophecy. This is in Isaiah 28. So, the only people who are going to receive that white stone are people who understand prophecy. And again, they are the people who are obedient to the Holy Covenants. Uh, and this new name is your tribe. This is the new name that you will receive. Yeah, a lot of times when people ask about the white stone, I just tell them, um, you know, keep the covenants promise. Go learn, go learn uh, what was spoken at Horeb. Because they'll never understand the white stone unless they follow the covenants of promise 100%. Yeah. You can't explain it to them. Yeah. Well, we're told you you're know, not don't supposed cast... to either. I mean, Yahshua said, don't cast your pearls before swine, right? Amen. You took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, you know, it's what's a, what's a pearl? It's a white stone. It's a precious stone. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's not something to... Um... And he even says in, in Revelation here... Um, it's a new name which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So, you know, if you go around to some apostate Christian and you say, oh, I'm from Naphtali, they're just going to laugh at you, you know, and it's like, well, don't cast your pearl before the swine. Yeah. yeah. But you can share it with your brothers. Why? Because we can become like one man. All right. Amen. 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 Um, also important in this little passage we just read in Revelation uh, 2, verse 17, uh, it starts with, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, so this is a good segue into the next part that Matthew's going to read. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, you know, this is directed to the seven churches in Revelation. And this is yep. what Matthew's probably about to show you. Will, uh, it might, like, I think it would blow minds, right? I, I say that, but, like, I'm imagining it, someone's just sitting there like this. Okay. But, I mean, this is, it this blew is my mind, mind. mind blowing if you've never you know, yeah. seen this before. So. Yep. It blew my mind, absolutely. So, the seven churches that Revelation was written to are all within Assyria, Turkey. And as Andrew was explaining earlier, where were the ten northern tribes scattered to? Assyria, Turkey. So Yeshua instructed John to write to the seven churches in Asia, which is Asia Minor, previously Assyria, um, or as I've, as we've said, Turkey, as we know today. So Revelation 1, 11 says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, uh, Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So, um, Andrew, if you if you can throw this yeah, uh, up there already. image, yeah. yeah, okay. So you can see on this uh, on this diagram here that we've got, um, you can see where all of these churches are located within uh, Asia, Asia Minor, Assyria, Turkey. Uh, so that they're all relatively close to each other uh so you, you know that like connect the dots you know you, you have to isaiah 28 tells us to to read line upon line uh you know so when you know that 
the ten northern tribes were scattered into Assyria, and you can see that all of these churches are within Assyria, you know that um, all of these churches, you know, he's speaking to the ten northern tribes. He's, he's, he's sending uh, this letter to the ten northern tribes. Um, so, continuing on on this same topic, uh, when you look at uh, Peter, uh, James, um, yeah, we've just we've got Peter and James here. First Peter is addressed to the elect strangers scattered throughout the nations in Asia Minor also. So verses 1 and 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bith Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Grace, conviction, unto you, and peace, holy covenants, be multiplied. All these nations were where the northern kingdom were scattered to, noting Galatia, same deal, uh, the northern kingdom dispersed into the Gentiles, who are Gentiles. So in James, uh, you have the same thing. It says, James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Yeshua Messiah, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greeting. So James wrote to the twelve tribes and no one else. He didn't write to the twelve tribes and the Christian church. You know, he wrote to the twelve tribes. Uh, so if if you don't want to be grafted into Israel, if you're going to fight, you know, and say, no, I'm a Gentile, well, then you can't read James. You, you, you have to, you have to um, assume that that isn't written to you. So, you know, you, you then can't use any scripture from James. So remember the dispersion, the lost brothers and sisters, the lost sheep were known to be in these northern nations at that time. John 7, 35, which we read earlier, is evidence for that. You know, that even the Pharisees themselves called uh, the Gentiles the dispersed because they knew that the ten northern tribes had been dispersed, scattered into these Gentile nations. Did we actually read, I think I might have made a mistake in the document. Did we read John seven thirty five earlier? Because I don't recall it now. Um, no, I think we did. We did. Is that the dispersed? Yeah, I mean, I can just quickly read it again in case, you know, you can tell me if we already read it. Um, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Did we read then, that? man, we yeah. read that. Okay. Yeah, I think it was when... But it's always that. good, man. We read, we, lots of times we, we go and read, like, chapters in triplicate, right? <laughs> yeah. Read it, like, three times over, so... It might have been whenever I was taking my hoodie off. Or I did, I, I zoned Maybe. out for a, a bit because I was, my mind was running. I was getting quite sad just thinking about how the, how people, you know, are so adamant to be Gentiles. And I kind yeah. of zoned out while you were reading some scripture, Adam, but it might have been during then. But yeah, okay. Glad we read it. It is sad, eh? That's very, very sad. sad. Cause it, yeah, because it means that they're going to burn in hell if they're, if yeah. they're not grafted in. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the, what you've just said, Adam, links in perfectly to what we're going to talk about here. So the New Covenant, uh, which again, you know, the, the Christian Church, we we went over this in the, the last video the three of us made, you know, that they will teach that we're in the New Covenant already, which doesn't make any sense. You know, we're in the refreshing of the covenant given to Israel. Yeshua came to refresh the covenant to strengthen that which is ready to die. So Jeremiah 31, verse 31, tells us clearly that the new covenant, which is that uh, God will give us new hearts when we're in the kingdom, is only made to Israel. And that's united Israel. That's both houses, you know, Israel and Judah uh, brought back together again. The two sticks made one. 
So it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And you know this hasn't happened yet because you keep reading uh, verses 32 and 34. And it says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husbandman unto them, saith the Lord. I always say a husband man there. I don't know why. Every single time I read that verse. Yeah, I was about to correct you and then you caught it, yeah. It, it's every single time. I don't know why. Hmm. It's uh, quite quite strange. Anyway, verse 33. But this shall be the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. So, you know, notice the difference. They're conjoined at this point. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And this is the, the important verse. And they shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So we know, we know that this covenant is made only with the house of Israel and the house, uh, and the house of Judah. Sorry, we know that this covenant made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah hasn't started yet for three reasons. So the first reason is the two elevated commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor. Um, we'll read Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. And it says, Yeshua said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So uh, as we've previously discussed, loving God, uh, Yeshua is quoting Leviticus, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, um, through to 8, specifically though Deuteronomy 6 verses 1 to 5, and Leviticus 19, 15 to 18 for loving your neighbor as yourself. And James calls this the royal law in chapter 2. Can I pause you real um, quick? Of course. The, the, I just want to mention, right, Yeshua says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that means you've got to go and see what the law and the prophets said. Yeah. He's telling you. It's a clue. It's not even a clue. It's just mm -hmm. straight, he's straight up telling you, go and learn the law and the prophets so you can understand what loving God for your heart, mind, and soul is and loving your neighbor as yourself is. Go and understand what I'm telling you because it's already written in the in the law of the prophets. You're not. This is. Yeah. I'm not creating anything new here. You don't get to make this up yourself. Yeah. This is from the law. Yeah, for of the some prophets. reason, they think that hang on means replace. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it yeah. doesn't make any sense. But with, yeah. And it's, it's funny that you bring that up, Andrew, actually, because when we first started the video and you were saying, you know, like, don't just take our word for it watching this video, go and search it out for yourself. And I was going to say it, but it just we got we got rolling and I, I didn't want to interrupt. But I was going to say, like, you sure said that as well. You know, he, he said, go and learn what this means. So have you not read? You know, like he's always saying, like, go and read what the scriptures say like don't just take my word for it and he's the son of god so like especially don't take our word for it yeah. go and read it for yourselves amen you know if there was anyone's word that you could have taken it would be his but still he's telling you go and go and look at it for yourselves yeah because he wants you to build your faith it's like he even god puts all the words in his mouth the father puts all the words every word that comes out of the son's mouth the, the father put there but he still tells you to go and learn this yourself because yeah. yeah he could just he could just say things and you sh absolutely should listen but he wants you to search these things out so that your faith builds and you connect the dots and you go ah you know when you have those like aha moments that's the holy spirit talking to you like when you're reading something yeah. and something jumps out at you at the page and you're like wait i've seen this here and then you go and read precept upon precept line upon line here a little there a little like we're commanded to that's that's how you build your faith you know yeah. Well, if you're just going to take our word for it and not go look in the scriptures for yourself, then you're going to go into tribulation. Yeah. Like wherever you are. I mean, yeah, you need yeah. to read your Bible. Absolutely. 
So, uh, yeah, with, without reading Deuteronomy chapter 6 to 8 to say what it means to love God with all of your heart, mind and soul, uh, which is essential, you know, you, you have to do that. Um, it means to keep his commandments. So, you know, we're told constantly throughout the scriptures, obey my commandments, obey my voice. I will be your God. You will be my people. So for Israel at the time, this meant the Ten Commandments, the Holy Covenant, as well as the sacrificial law, which was added because of transgression. For you, Christian Church, now that the Messiah refreshed the Holy Covenant, this simply means keep the Ten Commandments. So loving God, keep the Ten Commandments. okay, And loving your neighbor is like unto it. It means it's the same. You know, they're one within the, you can't have one without the other. And, and First John talks about this as well. You know, he says that herein we know that we love God when we love the children of God. So, yeah, um, yeah. well, there's uh, Leviticus 19 here, but I think we've read it already, so I'll, yeah. I'll move on. Uh, so, you can see that Yeshua can't have meant anything else in Matthew 22, 37 and 40. Because if God changes the definition of something later, then he is the author of confusion, and we know that he isn't. So let scripture define scripture, and when something is defined in the Bible the first time, that is the definition. It's, uh, what's the word for that? Uh, her hermeneutics or hermeneutics? Yeah. Hermeneutics, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't get to redefine things. You know, you don't, he, he tells us constantly, don't walk in the imagination of your own heart. You know, don't, don't, let, don't let yourself define what I've already defined. So the apostate church will say that the new covenant started at Yeshua's resurrection. But think about this. If Yeshua taught you to teach your neighbors not to sin, and the new covenant is that you don't have to teach your neighbors to know God, because everyone will know God, why would Yeshua have commanded you to, to rebuke your neighbor? Why would he have told you, you need to teach everyone to know God, if the new covenant that he began meant that you didn't? Like, it, it's just, it's contradictory, and it makes no sense. So, if, um, if the new covenant's already begun, Yeshua wouldn't have had to have given the elevated commandments, so that tells you straight away that we're not in the new covenant um and and very simply the new covenant says that everyone from the least until the greatest will know god uh the least is the people in hell and the greatest is the people in the kingdom now does everyone in the world does everyone in existence know god today absolutely not we have atheists and agnostics we have people in false religions who worship false gods you know the the whole world does not know god uh, even the apostate church itself has over fifty thousand denominations so if the new covenant is in effect now that would make god a liar and uh as well israel is still lost you know the when he tells us that he's going to gather israel that that's the second exodus that we're going to get into you know, unless, you know, I don't think I've missed the second exodus. I think that would be a pretty big event to just go unnoticed <laughs> in the world. So, you know, I, I don't think it's happened. Um, so, you know, there's, we are not in the new covenant. We're just, it's, we're not, you know, it's, it's very simple. So the new covenant is for the millennial reign, where only then will the house of Israel be gathered and Judah uh and Judah and the house of Israel will be able to receive the new covenant. So the new covenant clearly hasn't happened yet. And when it happens, it is only given to Israel, the reunited northern and southern tribes, no house of Gentiles. So there's two options. Be grafted in to Israel and be partakers in the kingdom or remain Gentiles and die in your sin and, and go, to, go to hell. So you see how ridiculous it is to remain adamant that you are a Gentile. If you remain a Gentile, you do not go to the kingdom. So be grafted in. You know, obey the holy covenants. Yeah. 
I mean, and the, that's, that's the thing. It's like the, the second reason and the third reason are the most clear, right? You can't receive a new covenant if you're still lost. And it simply says all, everyone will know God. Um, and that's just not the case today. You just pop your head out the window and you'll see that. But yeah, I think the good point for those of you is to hear the thing that will really drive it home is the, that fact that Yeshua taught to teach your neighbors not to sin and the new covenant is that you won't need to teach your neighbors not to sin. So how can that be? You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure too, he's going to wipe away our tears. Yeah. And that definitely hasn't happened yet. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you, yeah. um, you know, you, you're talking to someone and they say like, Oh, I promise you from now on, your car will never break down. Your car is absolutely never going to break down for the rest of time. But let me teach you how to repair it in case it breaks down. That's like what you're saying. If, if, um, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, Andrew, every time you, you do uh, an analogy like that, it's so, like, spot on. You just explain it so well. It's a real uh, talent that Yah has given you. I just say I just say random crap, man, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it makes sense, and then sometimes yeah. people yeah, are like, man, oh. it works, man. It definitely works, buddy. Yeah, I mean... Keep doing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> crazy, are then. You know, we, we, yeah, we, we've established yeah, now that only Israel make it to the kingdom. I think that's we've we've shown evidence of that, and you need to go and search that out in Scripture. But only Israel. So there's both houses, all twelve tribes. You reunited Israel, it's house of Israel, house of Judah. You know, southern and northern kingdom. They're the ones that make it to the kingdom of heaven, right? But the northern kingdom's been dispersed, um, and they've lost their identity in the world. So how do you be saved, right? What's the what's the plan for the lost sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Well, you become grafted in. What does that mean? few places we're going to go here we're going to start at jeremiah 3 uh specifically i'll just read verse 8 uh, and this tells us that backsliding israel and this is talking about the house of israel has been divorced all right it says and i saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding israel committed adultery i had put her away and given her a bill of divorce yet the treacherous sister judah feared not but went and played the harlot also so this this um what do we call it? An idiom or analogy of adultery is, is it's, it's you got to understand adultery is spiritual idolatry. That's um, like it's why God is a jealous God. It's just like why you know if you found out your wife cheated on you, you'd be jealous, right? It's just that that word is to describe um, idolatry against God. So the Northern Kingdom, um, you know, were divorced because of their idolatry or adultery towards God. Judah didn't even learn the lesson. They went and did the same thing. Um, but you know the northern kingdom were they were they were exiled for you know for in, in a long time uh, until they will return in the later days all right and the thing is northern kingdom been divorced and yet jeremiah 3 in verse 1 so this actually came just before verse 8 which i just read but i read it in the other way just to like for the flow of this video right jeremiah 3 1 says they say if a man put away his wife she go from him and become another man's and become another man's shall he return unto her again shall not the land be greatly polluted but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers yet return to me again saith the lord now that's very curious right because how can an adulterer return and be married again in this idiom and you've got to read all of hosea hosea one and all, all of hosea um, and understand the um, prophetic story of, um, you know, Hosea marrying the, the prostitute. But, and we do get into some of that. But um, how can you, how is God saying return if he's given us a letter of divorce? So he's saying, yet return to me. Okay. And we even know he said that if you love God, if we heart, mind and soul, when you're in tribulation, you're scattered abroad and turn to me that, you know, I'll, I'll have mercy on you. So how can this be? Because in Deuteronomy 24, this tells us that if you commit adultery, you can't be remarried. Right, it says, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, all right, adultery, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a, her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and send her 
sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. And after that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So you may not take her again, take, take her back again. Now, that's a problem, right? Well, what's the solution? It starts in John 17, verse 9 to 10. Yeshua says, I pray for them, I pray not for the not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So Yeshua came in the Father's Spirit, right? So now keep that in mind when we're going to read Romans 7 here. Uh, verse 1. I know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. Okay, so I'll stop here. Paul is saying, I'm only talking to know those who know the law. Okay, so you got to go back again. you got to go back. you got to read line upon line here a little, there a little, and read this part of the law. All right, he's saying, he, it's, in, it's in parentheses. It's a clue. I speak to them that know the law. So connect the dots. You go back, and you, we already did it. We read, um, re, you know, we read what he's like quoting from, um, for lack of a better term, in Deuteronomy 24. Um, so those are the things you've got to hear when you read scripture. You've got to keep an eye out for those things. And he says, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives, as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of the Messiah, that ye should be married to one another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Wow. Right? So you probably know where this Amen. is going. Okay? So Paul knew the law probably better than anyone on earth today, anyone alive today. And he's explaining to us that a woman can't remarry so long as her husband lives. You know, however, if her husband dies, she's free to remarry and is no longer an adulterer. So, recall Romans 9, we read it, verse 24, Paul quoting Hosea 1, he said that God has called not only the Jews, but the Gentiles, right? And in the next verse, he calls this group of Gentiles my people, which were not my people. Well, Hosea uh, chapter 2, verse 23, we get even more detail, and it says, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, thou art my people. And they say, they shall say, thou art my God. So Yeshua died for you to be able to be remarried with God. This is what Amen. dying for your sins means, even. You know, he died for our sins. This is what that means. You know, Israel sinned. Your ancestors sinned with idolatry, spiritual adultery, and they were divorced for that. Terrible sin, the sin that leads to death. And then Yeshua died for those sins so you could be remarried again, be born again and become one with him. As I just said that out loud, you know, idolatry is the sin that leads to death. Do you understand? The idol idolatry is the yeah. sin that leads to death, like it led mm -hmm. to Messiah's death because that had to happen yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, I it love doing this with you, brothers. Yeah. yeah. It leads to sacrificial law as well, but then it also leads to uh, the Messiah's death, but then, you know. It's double meaning, God right? A yeah, he pulled a fast one on the devil and mm -hmm. raised him up again, and he overcame death, and it was, you know, death has no more dominion. Yeah, it's a blessing to be able to to study the Word of God with you guys, and I just uh, I really hope that people hear this message and they 
they humble themselves and and seek it out for themselves because this is this is the gospel you know this is the gospel that we're studying right now it's incredible hey man i love searching out a matter with you guys or or um daily bible studies you know yeah amen yeah, Yeah, that I mean, if you want to talk in tickling scripture, that's it, right? Like, yeah, it's just that. That's just such a. That's just people need to. You need to understand this. This this is just so 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 important. You know, this is that's the gospel. Yeshua came. He ended sacrificial law. He refreshed the holy covenant. And that's the Ten Commandments. All right, you're allowed to be married again if you keep that covenant. That's simple. The gospel isn't this, okay, Yeshua died so I can do whatever's right in my own eyes and, and sin all I want because once saved, always saved. I can forsake that perpetual covenant and enter into the kingdom anyway, you know. That's the apostate church version, you know. That that's that's what the that's what the devil wants you to believe. That's not that's not the truth. And the, 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 you know, this is even why the Jews today um, well, you know, the ethnic Jews in Judah, that, fa that, that that group of people we were talking about, they don't care to go and get the lost sheep of the northern kingdom because they don't believe even that Yeshua is the Messiah. They don't think the northern kingdom is allowed to come back. All right? They think, okay, northern, king northern kingdom has been divorced. They know the law. They never lost the law. And they go, okay, northern kingdom has been divorced. You, you can't come back. You know, despite all the scriptures, even in the Old Testament, Forget if they don't read the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, it's always prophesied they'll come back. You know, that should be a clue to them. Like, oh, what? Jeremiah says, return to me? You know, that's part of the story. Okay, so you got to you got to find out, you know, you you got to keep reading, right? They should they should see this, but they don't, okay? Um, they don't understand this this concept that Yeshua's death is, is, is the way that, um, you know, the house of Israel can return. They don't understand that that's what Hosea is all talking about. So being grafted in means you become spiritual Israel. You inherit Israel's instructions, their covenants, their promises, and their curses. If you if you forsake the covenant, you inherit all the instruction to Israel. When you read scripture, that's you, Israel. That is who you are. If you be grafted in, you want to be Israel. You don't want to not be Israel. You don't want to be a Gentile. It's worse. It's, it's, if you're a Gentile, well, you know, you're dead. You're dying. You're, you're going to die. You know, and it's like, you can't be grafted in and then start calling the shots. This is like, mm -hmm. Paul says this, when we, we're going to see when we talk about the olive tree, you know, how much sooner will you be cut off if, if he's not if he's, if he's not even going to spare the natural branches for their transgressions, right? And this is what I like to say, is it's like if you move from America to Australia, right, and you become a citizen, and you're like, start driving on the right hand side of the road even though all of australia is driving on the left hand side and you say oh, i'm i've replaced australia i'm a, i'm a i'm an american i'm here now we drive on the right hand side of the road that was that's that law driving on the left that's for the australians you know how self-righteous right or, or, or we sometimes i'll drive on the left side sometimes i'll drive on the right side it just depends what suits me better you know Depends what street I'm going down. If I like this street, maybe it's easier for me to drive on the left because the place I'm trying to go to is on the left. If the place I'm trying to go to is on the right, I'll drive on the right. I don't care. If you do that, you get deported. You get cut off. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to show a picture of what a, a grafted tree looks like really quickly. So keep this in your mind. Okay, so this when we're talking about grafting, it just might just help with the visual component. Okay. Yeah, okay. and amen. Like, just go read Hebrews 10. And see what happens if you sin willfully after you've come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. There's no more mm -hmm. sacrifice for sins. Yeah. So here we go into Romans 11. This part, this is a super critical part of this whole video. This is really like the meaty part, right? Um, I shouldn't even say that. This whole, you know, you have to really read everything we put here. But, um, you know, Paul likens the Gentiles who repent uh, and are obedient to what the Messiah taught under the branches being grafted and into the olive tree, right? So I'll read at Romans 11, starting at verse 11. I'm going to read all the way to verse 27. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through this, through their fall, 
salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine offering, sorry, mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, see, partaking of the root, you get grafted in, you partake of the root. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the fruit, but the root thee. That will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So I'll pause there. Don't, you know, don't think, oh, you know, we've replaced Israel. Those, those branches were broken off because of unbelief, and we've come in and replaced Israel now. And have no fear of God in you because you think you can do whatever you like. Paul warns against this. Don't become proud. The church has absolutely become proud with this replacement theology that they've dreamed up. If he spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. It says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Oh, but I thought once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, right? How, how come I can be cut off? Once I'm in the tree, I can't be cut off. I was baptized when I was a baby. I said that prayer. You yeah. know? Yeah, I don't walk in covenant, yeah. but I was saved 10 years ago. No, you'll cut off. You'll be cut off. How do you read this if, if, if once saved, always saved doctrine in your head? It doesn't make sense. If you put up a Christmas tree, mm. you're going to be cut off. Because that's exactly what Israel did in the first place to get cut off. Second Kings 17, that's why we said, it's so important to go read yeah. Second Kings 17. Don't do what they did, or how much sooner will yeah. you be cut off? Um, Just do, you know, tear down the Christmas tree. Don't, don't do it. Yeah. You know, he told you yeah, in Jeremiah yeah. 10, don't learn the way of the heathen, because the ways of the heathen are vain. Yeah. Deuteronomy 12.30. Mm. Another place to go read. Um, even the, even the, uh, the next, next couple of verses is very important. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So you see, this is, this is the same thing. Judah, Judah can be grafted in also. They need to accept Messiah, the Messiah as well and keep the covenants, the holy covenants, of, you know, from Ephesians 2. Um, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now we're going to get into this later because there's some really interesting stuff around when is, has the fullness of the Gentiles came in yet. Fullness of the Gentiles coming in means the church has gone full blown apostate. Like apostasy has just um you know been uh you know been fulfilled, right? Um and there's a lot of prophecy around the church going apostate that's that's being fulfilled. And we even see, we're going to get into Ezekiel laying on his side and when that happened. And you know, it's going to get very interesting, so hang on. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungod ungodliness from Jacob. 
for this is my covenant under them, when I shall take away their sins. Is that so I mean? clear. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, yeah. Ah, it's so clear, isn't it? It's like, I'm, so, so clear. I want to, like, uh, commentate around that, but there's not even any need, because it's just put so plainly <laughs> and perfectly, right? Yeah. Because I think people can hear this, surely, right? So, you know, because of the size sacrifice, you can now be grafted into Israel. You can enter into the kingdom. You can enter into the new covenant. But don't be arrogant. You know, don't get proud. Because if you cut off the natural branches, how much sooner will we cut off the unnatural branches that were grafted in contrary to nature? So, you know, don't do what the northern kingdom did in 2 Kings 17. Spoiler alert, that means Christmas tree. That means Easter bunny. That means Halloween. That means any form of idolatry, any form of uh, sexual immorality, immorality, get that out of your life. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into the fire. Amen. Um, even Yeshua, he says this. Uh, well, this is um, we're gonna. I'm gonna see. You know, Yeshua being in the olive tree, right? Um, he says. Sorry, this is Isaiah, Isaiah 11, verse one. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So Je Jesse is uh, King David's dad. And uh, Zechariah, he uh, he even saw this vision long before the Messiah came. And this is in Zechariah uh, chapter 4. I'll, verse, I'll read verse 1 to 3. And the angel that, that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked. And behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes, to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So this is what you can see on the screen now. This is like the this is was David's flag right? originally. This is like if you wanted to put a real flag of Israel up, this would be it. It's not um you know, this six-pointed star, like the one you put on top of your Christmas tree. As a matter of fact, I think that that is the, um, the, the star Remphan talked about in Acts uh, 7.43, where it says, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I'll carry, carry you away beyond Babylon. Um, and this is even here, what you can see now on the screen. This is um, Moloch, uh, you know, idol outside of the Colosseum in Rome, and look what's on his chest. The star Rimpan, right? His star. So you've got to get all sorts. This is why it's so, so evil to use a Christmas tree, and it's sneaky, it's hidden. Like, you know, the church has done a really big sin in causing everyone, you know, causing everyone to sin here. Like, it's telling you that it's just, it's just a tree, don't worry about it, doesn't matter. It's not just a tree, it's not just a star on top, you know. It's an Asherah pole. And you're propping up a, a you know, star rim fan. God hates these things, and He warned exactly against not doing this. Mm -hmm. um, coming back to our faces, John 15 um, verses 1 to 6. Yeshua uses a, a, a parable of sorts of a vine. He says, "I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit." He purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now we are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit for itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now listen to this. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The lake of fire, hell. Yeah. So you have to abide in Yeshua, or you get cast into the fire, you get cut off, however you want to say it, right? You get cast into the fire. That's the most scary way to say it, right? And John 14 tells so how do you abide in him? John 14 tells you that. Okay, you need to abide in Yeshua or you get cast into the fire. So you've absolutely got to read that and be like, oh crap, how do I abide in Yeshua? 
Is it as simple as just saying, I love, I, I love Jesus, you know, a couple times a week on a Sunday? Like, is it, is it just that simple? That you should have that urgency about you. This is such a serious matter. You should have the fear of God in you that you want to be absolutely sure you're abiding in him according to scripture, not according to what some apostate pastors taught you. So you read John 14 and it tells you how to do this. If ye love me, keep my commandments. What were the two commandments he elevated? Love your neighbor as yourself, and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Which isn't, I mean, we don't need to say this again. It's not what you've redefined it as. It's already been defined. And I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am my, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Right? So this is just five verses after the when he says keep the commandments. It would have been in probably the same breath. He says this, keep my commandments, and that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you, a.k.a. abiding in you, abiding in me. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he is he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Okay, so very clear, to abide in Yeshua. Matter of fact, even to love Yeshua means to keep his commandments. What commandments? Is it the sacrificial Amen. law added because of transgression in Galatians 3.19? No. It's the Ten Commandments. Okay? To love Yeshua means to keep the, the Ten Commandments in the Rainbow Covenant. Ezekiel. Okay, so now we're going to look at the two sticks. Ezekiel 37, verse 15 uh, to 28. So this tells us yet again that the two houses will one day, in fact, become one again. Okay, so uh, here we go. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick, and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. Right, so uh, northern kingdom. One stick southern kingdom, one stick northern kingdom. And join them one another into one stick. And he shall become one in thine hand. And do you know what, matter of fact, I was going to mention this after I've read the scripture, that how in the Strong's Concordance, stick means tree. Um, but I'll mention it now so that you can have that in your mind as, we re as you listen to this, or hopefully as you read it along yourself. Stick, I'll pull the photo up. This is a screenshot of the Strongest Concordance. The word that's you translated here as stick means tree. Tree, trees, wood. That's it. Very simple. Um, you can see you know, the count of times, I mean, all the different things it was translated as. 74 times, times tree. 71 times trees, the plural. 111 times wood. Um, it's It's... It's only used sticks really here in this um, little passage. So it's I, 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 what I will say is this is like we know we have the lion pin of the scribes throughout our scriptures. I would venture, to, venture a guess that this is the lion pin of the scribes because they don't want you to make the connection between the olive tree and the two sticks. Okay, so when it says um, and join one to another into one stick, it's saying into one tree, right? So... Uh, you've got a tree of Judah, a tree of uh, northern kingdom, they become one tree. And when the children of my people shall speak unto, the, unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in, in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be the king of them all, to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Super clear. One day these two sticks will become one. They're going to have one united kingdom. The, the, he's going to gather the northern kingdom, put them in the land, and um, you're going to have a united Israel once again. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with idols, nor with detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Remember, my people who are not my people. All right. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their presence for shall be their prince forever. Moreover I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them for evermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them for evermore. I mean, it doesn't get much more clear than that, right? Yeah. Now, so, the thing is, so the church, they're the foolish versions. Okay, they're the ten versions from Yeshua's parable in Matthew 25. We, you know, it's like everyone is. And it's like, are you going to be wise or are you going to be foolish? Okay, the church isn't replacing Israel. You know, uh, this, this, this is the whole point of the video, right? We're debunking replacement theology. But the apostate church has to realize that they are the ten virgins from, Yesh from, virgins from Yeshua's parable. So, this is Matthew 25, verse 1 to th uh, 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgin virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise. You remember the uh, the whole parable in Hosea about the the marriage, right? You know, so this is always going to happen. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise, the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay? I know you not. If you don't have oil in your lamp, I don't know you. You, 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 you. The door's shut. So, what's the lesson to watch there for? What does watching mean? Become a watchman. Do the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, now, yeah, you compare that to Matthew seven twenty two to 23. And this is like everyone should know this, this passage. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So I never knew you. I know you not. Same language. 
He's quoting yeah. himself. Um, yeah, I mean the the the, the, ch the church. It's like they are you 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 are Gentiles, but then you got to be grafted in. You don't want to remain a Gentile. So if you keep the covenant, you be, be grafted into the Commonwealth of Israel. Paul even says, "Don't become proud." We just read that. Don't do the same things the ancient Israelites did in Second Kings seventeen, because you'll get plucked out even quicker than they did. Okay, but you know the church doesn't listen. You know. You've, you've absolutely got him proud. You even think you've replaced Israel and no one can, you know, you can go off and do whatever you want. Pagan witchcraft in the church. Lie to your children about Satan claws existing and, you know, because you're once saved, always saved. So it doesn't matter. You can just do what's right in your own eyes and your own deceitful heart. No, you're going to get cut out. Paul even, there's Paul telling you this. It's Paul. This isn't what Moses said. You know, this is what Paul said. You know, and it's just you know, the apostate church just can't accept that they're, they're the ten virgins. It's like it's not good enough for them or something. You should be you should be grateful that you can even have the opportunity to be grafted in through the Messiah's death. You know, you should be grateful. It's like is that not good enough for you? You know, but they just yeah. can't accept it, right? And so, you know, some will be wise and some will be foolish. And the ones doing Christmas and Easter not keeping the covenant from Horeb, you know, which is mm -hmm. if you want to read about that, Deuteronomy five. You know, they're the foolish ones. They're building their house on the sand. And that house will fall greatly. Great will be the fall of it. Well, they can't even keep the seventh day of the week. Yeah, it's a burden. The burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. To have a day of rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if you go back to Matthew 15, um, you know, that, that like we said we would, um, we'll look at all of verse 21 to 28 now. This is the passage where Yeshua says he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we're going to read around it now. Um, there's also an image that I want to pull up. Let me sort that out. No, where did I put it? It's right here. Okay. Um, here we go. So verse 21. Then Yeshua went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, so I'm going to show you where that is. Right here. So here's the co here's Tyre, here's Sidon, here's the coast, right? You can see in this uh, in the bottom right here. Okay, again, it's in the, it's it's in the north. Um, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grieved, is grievously vexed with a devil. Um, but he answered not a word. And the disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she, cry, uh, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent for unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Yeshua answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You see, so this woman, it was good enough for her to be grafted in. And look at the blessing she received, you know. She didn't care to say, no, no, no I'm, uh, Israel doesn't exist. I'm, I'm, I'm the chosen one now, you know. She was like, yeah, I'm just a dog. Let me eat the scraps. Let me be grafted in, please, your master. She worshipped my master. Please, she worshipped him, you know. So she was a Gentile. She was in the north here. You just saw the image. She was in the northern kingdom, scattered. Here she gets grafted in through this uh, prophetic story of uh, a showing of faith, you know. Mm. And this happened for a reason. You know, Yeshua didn't just stumble across this woman. This wasn't by by chance. You know, every single thing that yeah. Yeshua said out of his mouth, and every single step he took, and every single everything, every single thing that he did was all uh, from straight from God. You know, this is all happening yeah, for a reason. It's not just a coincidence. You know, the apostate church though, they'll read this and say, "Oh, see, she was saved, and all she had to do was, um, you know, show show a little faith and say a couple of things." No, this is a prophetic story. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this all happened to prove the point that the Gentiles, the lost sheep of the house of Israel scattered into Syria up north can be grafted in because you've got to understand this yeah. is at a time where there's contention around this very idea. You know, Judah's saying no, 
and Yeshua is trying to prove, look, you can be grafted in. And I'll do it to this woman right here, right now. You know, and her child was made well. So. Um, yeah, and there's a lot. There's a lot of racist people out there that are like, oh, well, you're a Canaanite. You're you can't, you know, never be saved or whatever. Yeah. But uh, especially like even just look at uh, what is it, Matthew ten four. One of the disciples was a Canaanite. Right, Simon the Canaanite. Um, you can just throw that doctrine out the window. Like the any, doctrine. anybody can come into covenant. Anybody can keep the Ten Commandments. Anybody can come into covenant. Mm -hmm. How to be grafted into Israel? You must keep the Ten Commandments to be grafted. To be grafted in. Okay, so we're gonna read uh, Isaiah fifty-six. Verses 3 to 7. And it tells us this. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the, unto the eunuchs that kept my Sabbaths and chose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a better and a name better than the sons and daughters. So, wait, a name better than the sons, than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, Whitestone, that it shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make, make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people pretty simple to be grafted into israel and god's kingdom you have to keep the holy covenant uh back to hosea 4 6 tells us if if you reject knowledge god will reject you yeah verse 6 my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no more, no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Okay, remember, my people, which were not my people, are those who were grafted into spiritual Israel. The question begs, what is knowledge? from the root Hebrew word yada, which means to know. Let's keep reading in Hosea 6, 6 to 7. We get more detail here. <clears throat> Verse 6, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. <clears throat> there, have they dealt treacherously against me? Yeshua himself even told you to go and learn what it means in Matthew 9, 13, when he says, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So clearly, knowledge has something to do with mercy. So what is mercy? Yeshua, what, it, what is this uh, mercy that Yeshua was speaking of? How do we obtain this mercy? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. 
and repayeth them. So Adam, hate if them. I can just interrupt quickly, it's worth yeah. mentioning as well. Um, a generation, according to scripture, is 70 years. So a thousand generations, 70,000 years, you know, it's symbolic for forever. You know, there is no limit. There's no expiry date on keeping the commandments. It means, you know, let's rephrase <laughs> it. Keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments forever. You know, a thousand yeah. generations, you know. He's not saying that's to the year 59, 99, 99 or whatever it would yeah, work. Yeah, out to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's it's like, it means forever. Amen. Uh, verse 10. And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Deuteronomy 5, 9 to 10, tells us the same thing. You must read this whole chapter, by the way, because this is the chapter which tells us the covenant at Horeb is the Ten Commandments. Verse 9, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse 10, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So to be grafted into Israel, uh, it is simple. Keep the Ten Commandments. Yeshua tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Okay, verse 8. Come on, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that was verse 28. It's just a typo here. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, he even tells us to learn of him. Learn what this easy yoke and light burden is. At this point, I would say go and watch. Yeah, okay. So go and watch the other video that we did, The Simple Gospel. Um, and we're going to leave a, a, a link to that in the description. If, if you don't listen to all the scriptures we show you in that video, at least consider Proverbs 19, verse 16. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his, soul, his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. Otherwise, get ready to hear. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah, you don't want to hear that. Matthew 7, 21 to 27. Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the, into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the work of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Sorry, I just kind of stop right here just for a second to say that devils are cast out by the finger of God. The finger of God is the Ten Commandments. If you're not keeping the Ten Commandments, you're not casting out devils, you're filled with them. Mm -hmm. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will, I will liken him unto a wise man which buildeth his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which, which built his house upon sand. 
and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The wise man builds his house on the rock, which is the rock of Horeb, and keeps the commandments given in Deuteronomy 5. The foolish man is the, is the apostate church prophesied to fall, who know, who know, who know the true gospel but forsake, forsake it to go off to commit spiritual adultery. Uh, so Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, Halloween, um, the list goes on. Pretty much every holiday is linked to paganism some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and I want to say as well, like in this, so you see how Yeshua's parables all sort of echo each other, right? And here we have, you know, we just read about the wise and foolish virgins. So you want to be that wise one who picks up the oil. But how do you be wise, right? You see again here in this parable, we see the wise man builds his house on the rock and the foolish man builds his house on the sand. The wise virgin, the foolish virgin. So how do you be wise? Build, yourself, build your house on the rock. What is the rock? The rock at, Hor at Horeb here. The Ten Commandments were given in Deuteronomy 5. The foolish man builds his house on the sand or not on the rock. You know, or if you really like, want to start speculating on things, well, what sand is, is small, like crumbled up rocks, right? So you could say, you know, maybe a, a virgin of the Ten Commandments where they say, oh, you know, um, no, we worship on Sunday, that every day is our Sabbath. Uh, no, you know, loving your neighbor means giving them a sandwich, you know. But that's just like kind of ideas, right? But the key takeaway is build your house on the rock. That's how you be the wise virgin, you know. Amen. After you've received knowledge, don't turn back. So once you've received the truth, you have to stay in it. Now, we just read this or talked about this earlier. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Amen. Matthew 10, 37 puts it another way. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy, worthy of me. Then on the, on the contrary, Yeshua says in Matthew 19, 29. Okay, verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Hosea 6, verses 4 to 6 tells us, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away. So how's that going to happen in a once saved, always saved, uh, you know, belief? So this is just, that's garbage. Uh, once saved, always saved is garbage. If they shall fall away, to renew them, to renew them again onto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. But the church won't show you that verse. Or if they do, they will twist it to tickle your ears. Because this right, because this right here should completely debunk once saved, always saved. So ask the pastor how this can be. If once saved, always saved is true. And watch them <laughs> crap their pants and fumble to give you an answer. Amen. Don't be like Lot's wife. Genesis 19, 24 to 26. Verse 24. Then the Lord, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him 
and she became as a pillar of salt. So when you come out of spiritual Sodom, don't look back. You can't drink from the cup, from both cups. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. You cannot drink of, of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. Proverbs 26, 11 puts it plainly. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. And remember what happens to foolish men who build their house upon the sand? They fall. Now go and read the parable of the seed sower in Matthew 13 to see what Yeshua has to say about this matter. Any thoughts on that? I think we covered it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's... Uh... You, you can't be uh, on the fence when it comes to obeying God. You know, you can't be kind of one foot on, on the Holy Covenant and another foot in the world. You know, you, it's a, you have to fully. And that's, so that's the thing as well. If you actually want to follow God, you know, you're going to just, he's going to chip away at your life. So just a not to go off topic, but just a, a very small part of my testimony, like, you know, the, the life I came from, you know, a musician wanted to tour all around the world and play all these gigs, you know, like when I started reading the Bible and I would be talking to my wife, who was, you know, uh, we, well, not going into biblical marriage and all that stuff, but, you know, just sort of girlfriend at the time. But like, I would say to her, like, oh, I can, like, I can still go on tour. Like, I'll just read the Bible, like, be, like backstage and stuff, you know. And, like, you know, I knew I was, like, there's no way that's going to happen. You know, so when you start to follow God, like, he will just take away um, these desires to be in the world if you truly want to follow him. But, uh, yeah, if, if you decide to, to go, uh, if you decide to follow the ways of the world instead of following God once he's, he's convicted you and... You know, you do despite under the spirit of grace. You're going to see your conscience with a hot iron. Yeah. Like if you get yeah. given that spirit of grace, which is conviction, conviction to keep the covenants, you should be so, so, so grateful that you've yeah. been called. But then you have to choose because many are called and few choose, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. If you get given that spirit of grace and you feel convicted to read the Bible and you start doing it and you see these truths and then you, you quench that spirit, you, you know, you, you, you suppress it because you still have a love for the world. You're still drinking out of that other cup. It's worse for you than if you just never received conviction in the first place, which is grace. You know, so yeah. you've really got to, this is serious warnings. You sure says it many times, you know, to uh, don't, don't, don't live in the world. The world will hate you. That's how you know that your mind is if the world hates you. That's why he said that he's, you know, he's come to tear households apart because not he doesn't want that to happen, but he knows how the world is. And he knows, you know, if, if, if you love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, that your family's going to hate you. People are going to hate you. They're going to talk illly against you. You're going to be um, persecuted. And, you know, the, the, the yeah. thing is the Christian church, they know this. They know that this, this is what he's said. So they, you know, they like to play the victim and and twist it away and be like, yeah, Christians just have it so tough these days. You know, everyone hates Christians. Everyone thinks they're weirdos. But it's like, no, they don't. Especially if you go to like um, Northern America, like the United States, where it's like these huge Christian populations. It's the whole world does their holidays. The whole world does Christmas and Easter with them. All the, you know, every president of the United States is a Christian. You know, all, all the mega celebrities are Christians. You've got Justin Bieber on your side. Like, no one thinks, you know, Christians are weirdos. No one's persecuting Christians. The people that are getting persecuted are the ones that rebuke and the ones that fulfill the royal law and the ones that scream. Yeah. It's just like Yeshua did, just like Paul did, just like Peter did. You know, they, you know, Stephen, like, they, they just, you, you get persecuted when you tell people that you have to obey to receive the Holy Spirit because people hate to hear that. They want, they want to continue yeah. in the ways of the world. They love Babylon so much. They don't want to come out of here, my people, like he told you to. And they, 
and they hate being told you have to be obedient to receive the spirit of truth. And those are the people that get persecuted. Like you should not to, you know, just as a testimony, but you should see like some of the stuff that people say to like, you know, brother Alex, like he, he gets it terrible. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like Mm -hmm. he gets death threats, like all the brothers and sisters doing the Royal law, like people hate them, you know? Um, and that's yeah. just like prophet. Okay, so then you know you're doing something right. It's not like you do it yeah. so that people can hate you because you want to get a box ticked. You do it because you love the people and you know that there is a remnant that will have ears to hear and that will remember in the later days. You know, Ezekiel thirty three thirty three. They'll remember a prophet was in their midst, someone that entered into the room yeah. of the prophet and reaped what they didn't sow and the, re- rejoiced together. You know that's why you do it. And then the fact that people hate you because of it's just like. It's just confirmation. It's just like a faith builder, but you don't desire that. No one wants anyone to hate them. Yeah. How much easier would it be yeah. if everyone loved us for what we did? You know, <laughs> we reach more people. You know. I I I definitely don't want that. I mean, because I can see the curses being placed upon their heads when they do that to us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They have no idea what they're doing. Like, yeah. Father, yeah. please forgive them. They don't know what they do. May they may may they find mercy, right? Yeah, like Elijah didn't. May, want may they learn what that means. Yeah, yeah. You you don't want it to happen because you, it's a sad thing, you know. Yeah. So moving on, um, God is calling His people right now. You know the, the we've gone through uh, Israel being dispersed been going through the prophecies that were written about Israel being grafted back in, Israel being called, and now that prof- that prophecy is being fulfilled as we speak. God is calling his people right now. Um, and he tells them, come out of her, my people. So God wants you to come out of the apostate church, uh, which is, uh, is a whore. It's a, it's a disgusting whore, a, a big, ugly whore, as Andrew's written here. Amen. Uh, according to the book of Revelation, so in chapter 18, verse 1 and 5, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So what we were talking about earlier, you know, uh, idolatry is committing adultery with God, or to God, against God. Mm -hmm. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the mercy And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So, absolutely, look at how powerful and wealthy the church is. Trillions, trillions, you know, it's disgusting. Um, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So as we've been going through, uh, this study, you know, my people is referring to Israel. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto hev- heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So Hosea 12, verse 6, talking about both kingdoms' transgressions, says, Therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. So mercy and judgment, fulfill the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Rebuke the sin out of the church, you know. As we have, you know, we've come out of her and now we're shouting into the church, you know, warning them of the sins that they are committing. And we're, 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 uh, we're blowing the trumpet, warning of the, the coming sword. So Yeshua already taught us what mercy means. So this, you know, Hosea 12, 6 could read, Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep the Ten Commandments and royal law, and wait on your God continually. That is what you're supposed to hear. 
that's why Isaiah 28 10 tells us to read scripture in this month you know precept upon precept line upon line here a little there a little so Hosea 14 verse 1 says O Israel return unto the Lord thy God for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity in Isaiah 57 verses 16 and 21 we see prophecy of entering the kingdom if we have a contrite and humble spirit toward God. So it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth. For the spirit should fall, sorry, for the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was wroth and smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the heart, sorry, in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace, to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, and there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So when Yeshua was talking to Judah, he even told them he had sheep that were not of their fold that must return in John 10, 14 and 16. He said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so I know the father, sorry, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So he's talking about a second sheepfold. So when he came and he walked the earth uh, 2,000 so years ago, you know, that was the first sheepfold. And now the people who are coming out of the apostate church, as we speak, it's the second sheepfold. So we know from Matthew 15, 42, which we read earlier, that Yeshua came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this passage in John is clearly talking about Israel as well. So it's the first sheepfold of the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the second sheepfold of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, you know, as I just said before, you know, when you come out of the church and you, you know, you you are it's revealed to you the sins of the church christmas and easter and you know breaking the holy covenants not keeping the sabbath all of these different things you know it's you can't just um if you have that revelation you can't just sit on it and kind of be like oof you know dust yourself off and say i'm glad i'm out of here you know but that's it you know you you have to then you have to go back in with this fresh set of eyes, you know, with the rose tinted glasses taken off and you have to go in and you have to try and get your brothers and sisters out as well. So not only is God calling you to be grafted in, but Yeshua tells you that it is not good enough to just return yourself, but to also go and get the others of his flock. That's why he asked Peter three times if he loved him. And every time he said, go and feed my sheep. So in John 21, 15, to 18 it says so when they had dined Yeshua saith to Simon Peter Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me more than these he saith unto him yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee he saith unto him feed my lambs he saith to him again the second time Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me he saith unto him yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Um, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? 
And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So this is a requirement. You, you can't feed your own belly. You can't receive all of this, all of this knowledge and all of this wisdom about, you know, the, the prophecy of the last days and then not do anything with, with it. So if you love Yeshua, you will love his sheep. And if you don't love his sheep, then you don't love him. So, you know, first John, like we said, uh, you know, herein we know we love God when we love the children of God. And when Yeshua gave the elevated commandments, he said, you know, they're one and the same. So going back to John 14, 15 and 21, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if there was still any doubt, First uh, John 5, 1 to 3, which I've just talked about, confirms this, that, you know, everyone that loveth him, that begat, which, you know, it's talking about God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You go and tell a Christian to follow the holy covenants and they will say you, you're putting a curse on them. They'll say that you're putting the law of sin and death on them. They'll say, you know, Judaizers, don't put that burden on me. And it's disgusting, you know, they're just, they don't realize what a blessing it is to, to walk in the Holy Covenants. It's the peace. My peace, uh, what is it? My peace I give unto you and, you know, some paraphrasing, but something like that. You know, he wants, he's given us these Holy Covenants to walk in because he knows that this is what is best for us. <clears throat> so if you're paying attention, you're going to see that, you know, the reason we're making this video is because we're doing what Yeshua told us to do. You know, we have come out. Well, you know, me and Andrew, not so much. Um, you know, we, we've never been a part of, um, I, I, I was an atheist, you know, I, I was completely, I wasn't part of the church at all. I went for a couple of months when I first started reading the Bible, but you know, that, um, Still, I have been shown the apostasy of the church and the lies of the church. So now I have an obligation as a, as a servant, and these brothers do as well, and all of our brothers do, and our sisters as well, that as servants, you have to go and find the lost sheep. You have to love your neighbor as yourself, because if you don't, you don't love God. So Amen. If, you've yeah. if you're watching this video and you've made it to this point, you have been called, you know, coincidences don't exist. If you're watching this video and you've made it all the way to this point, God has is, is shown you this for a reason. And he is, uh, he's given you a choice right now. Do you listen to the words we're telling you and you go and search out in scripture for yourself? And do you enter into the work? Or are you going to watch this and just, you know, brush it off and say, ah, I'm not going to go and search it out. They're probably wrong. You know, and the reason you do that is because of pride. Because you don't want the world to hate you. Yeah. You want to be accepted. You want to be loved. You know, and if you do that, woe to you. You know, if you're watching this video, you will not be held in ignorance. You know, come the day of judgment, if you don't do anything, you know, he's going to say to you, I sent you my servant. What did yeah. you do? You did nothing. Coward. You know, coward. Many are called and few are chosen. Few choose. So, kind of going back to a, a bit of prophecy here. The reason why all of this is happening now, and, you know, the reason why the lost sheep are, raising, are rising up now, is because, you know, the, the prophecy that we told you about earlier, about um, Israel receiving a punishment for their, um, for their sins in 2 Kings 17. Um, that punishment is, is the, the details of it are given in Ezekiel, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. So it says that, um, it says, thou, thou also, son of man, 
take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the, the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days thou shalt lie upon thou shalt thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days, so that thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So Israel went into captivity around 722 B.C. And Ezekiel received this prophecy where he was to lay on his left side for 390 days, a symbol of the punishment for the northern kingdom. But the northern kingdom did not repent. They didn't turn back to God, and uh, God had already said long before in Leviticus that if they don't repent, he will punish them seven times more. So in Leviticus 26, verses 13 and 21, it says, I am the... 13 to 21 it says sorry uh, i am the lord your god which brought you forth out of the land of egypt that you should not be their bondmen and i have broken the bands of your yoke that you might go upright yeah, you might walk in my holy covenants but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul shall abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you will be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth. And it is, so this is the important verse here, verse 18. And if you will not yet for all of this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me, then I will not hearken unto you, and will not hearken unto me. I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. So we know that Israel didn't repent, uh, you know, as it says in uh, verse 16, you know, all the, they went into captivity, they were in bondage, you know, it was horrible for them, and yet they still didn't repent. So the 390 years was increased sevenfold. So seven times 390 equals 2,730. So if you subtract the date of the exile, 722, you get the year 2008 AD. So around this time, you know, you the world, uh, you know, all across the world, people started to uh, obey the Holy Covenant. You know, they started to follow the Torah of God. And, you know, some people went way off to the right. Um, some people, you know, well, the Christian church are already on the left, but you know that there has been a remnant of people who have started to follow the Holy Covenant and have started to obey God as he commanded. And, you know, to follow the true gospel. <clears throat> so, it's possible 
Um, actually, no, I'm not sure if that bit is, is right now. Because I think the fullness of the Gentiles, yeah, the fullness of the Gentiles is talking about the apostasy of the church. So this bit in the notes, Andrew, I think, yeah. needs to be taken out. Yeah, so, you know, this this curse that was put over Israel has now finished. And, you know, people are starting to realize who they are. They're starting to realize that they are Israel. And, you know, earlier when we read that, um, you know, the remembrance of their name would be removed, that was part of the curse. That was part of the 2,730-year curse. But now that curse is over, it's finished. And Israel are starting to rise up out of the Gentiles. And the, the, the process of God bringing them back to the land is, is beginning or has begun. <clears throat> so, I, it's important to detail that what we're going to talk about here, we're not teaching as absolute fact. This is speculation, okay? But it's it's a fairly um, it's a it's a fairly well established guess, okay? Because you can take some pretty accurate historical data uh, from a few different sources, and you can compile it together to come to a, a very interesting conclusion. So, in Hosea six, verses one and two. It says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So this is talking about the Messiah. So it says, After two days of him tarrying, of him waiting, he will raise up, and on the third day he will revive us. So, in Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So when you put those two scriptures together, you know, to rephrase uh, Hosea 6, 1 and 2, you could read it as, After two thousand years, he will revive us. And in the third thousand, in the in the third, he will raise us up. So if Yeshua died in 28 AD, like, you know, uh, there are a few different things that suggest he did. Uh, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, uh, who is a pretty, um, you know, reliable source. He's, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of historical records from that time are based on his uh data collections, he said that the Messiah was crucified 42 years before the temple destruction in 70 AD, which would leave us at 28 AD. So if you add 2,000 years for two days, before subtra subtracting three and a half years for great tribulation, as per Revelation 12, 14, time, times and a half, and Revelation 13, verse 5, 42 months, you arrive at the sixth seal opening in springtime 2024, and only the 144,000 will be caught up to the throne. The church is the woman in the wilderness who births the man-child. So this is what we've been talking about. Come out of her, my people. The 144,000 and... I also have to make a disclaimer. We are not claiming to be the 144,000. I'm not going to count myself in that number, okay? But the 144,000 will come out of her, my people. Mm -hmm. They will be birthed by the woman, by the church, okay? This is a, this is a much bigger... Um, topic you know to just to go fully into now so you know that this will go into this in another video but you know this is uh 
we're looking at a possible date of the Messiah's return, you know, and really the point of the point we're making here is just how urgent time is. You know, we really yeah. don't have a lot of time left. You know, it's it's so it's such an urgent matter that you start to obey the two covenants, you know, Ephesians two. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to repent now, yesterday. And obey the holy covenant. Amen. That's the thing. We're not like you know, I don't want people to think we're like set in dates. We're not like you know, we could be well wrong on this. Like there's even scripture that suggests yeah. maybe Yeshua was closer to forty when he died because you know how the um he says oh you know I've seen Abraham and the Pharisees say you're not even forty how yeah. have you seen Abraham well do you know that maybe that implies he was in his thirties so you know we could be way wrong. That's the thing. Like, and there's, we were even like, do we include this or not? You know, because it's not even really the point of that. The point we're trying to make is the urgency, not yeah. yeah. Keep an eye out for springtime next year. You know, it's just you need to yeah repent right now, as you said yesterday. Like, um, it's it's yeah. not a bit like no one here is set in dates. You know, um, if I, you know, at a push, I think you know the the um, punishment of Israel was probably lifted sometime around two thousand and eight. Uh, and you know the Messiah's return is near. That's I can say that for, yeah. sure, for certainty. But yeah, I just want to really drive that home that we're just trying to note the urgency rather than set any dates for the return of the Messiah because you know yeah. no man knows the day. So, so that's the interesting thing is though is that you know when you study the parable of the untimely stakes, you know we we can know and we do know that the sixth seal will be a springtime event. Yeah. We know it's going to be in the spring. And uh, Paul tells us, you know, brethren, you're not ignorant of the fact that uh, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So, you know, we couldn't possibly say a day or an hour, but we know it's going to be in the springtime. And we know that it's going to come unexpectedly. You know, we know that uh, they're going to say peace and safety and then comes the sixth seal. So, you know, of course we don't know a day or an hour, but we know we know that it's gonna creep up on the on the blind like a thief in the night. Yeah. It's also like, you know it, it's it's interesting as well that there was that big um, recession in Mystery Babylon in two thousand and eight. Like you kind of think about things like that, like, you know, oh maybe mm -hmm. maybe that you know, maybe a lot of people, you know, when times are tough, people come to their faith, right? People get on their knees and, yeah. you know, maybe that had something to do with things, you know. There's all these sorts of things that you think about. That, I mean, yeah, you know, that's why he says, watch ye therefore, you know, that means become a watchman, do the royal law. So, you know, yeah. if you're watching, you're doing the royal law and like, he'll, you know, he will reveal some things to you, you know, and he, he won't come like a thief yeah. in the night. So it's not about setting a, a, a specific day and hour, but you know, you got to know the seasons you're in, like what, you know, the weather tomorrow, but you don't know the times you live in, you know? Yeah. It's also worth mentioning as well that the, the first revelation 12 sign, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, you know, September 23rd, 2017, that happened. So the first revelation 12 sign has already taken place. So we know that the second, the red dragon being cast down the sixth seal, we know it's close. We know it's very, very, very close. Mm. So, you know, time really is of the essence right now, you know, and the rest of prophecy that's been fulfilled, you know, the, the fullness of the Gentiles, the full-blown apostasy of the church, the watchmen raising up, you know, everything is happening right on time, you know. So the sixth seal is the next, is the next thing. You know, it's the next, well, the 11th hour harvest workers raising up, you know, but we are digressing a little bit here. But, um, you know, we're, we're so close to the end. And, yeah, the, the parable of the unjust steward in Luke 16, Andrew did a great video on that, and the link's going to be in this document as well. But, you know, the unjust steward, you know, he owes uh, the, the servants or the master, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred, you know, and he says, okay, you know, just quickly write a check for half, you know, give us 50. And, uh, that's, that's, that's what the watchmen are doing, you know, okay, we, we owe him this much, but just quickly, two covenants, 10 commandments, don't touch the blood, eat clean. 
That's it. That's Damn all it. you need to do. Yeah. That's all you need to do. So if you're watching this, just obey the Ten Commandments, eat clean, don't touch the blood, and you'll be good. Yeah. And so, you know, it begs the question, well, how, how do Israel get back to the land? We've established that, you know, the new covenant's only for Israel. You have to be grafted in. They're going to be grafted in. They were exiled in the first place. Well, then how do they, you know, how do, how do Israel get back to the land? The house of Israel get back to the kingdom, right? Get back to the, uh, you know, what happens, right? So the second exodus is what happens. And, um, you know, we know that it will be so great that no one will even be mentioning the first one out of Egypt. And this is told in Jeremiah 16. Um, verse 14 and 15 therefore behold the days come saith the Lord that it shall be that it shall no more be said the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and all the lands whither he have driven them and I'll bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers therefore behold the day oh, sorry and then this is the same thing again in Jeremiah 23 uh, 7 to 8 Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which, uh, yeah, I might have, no, this is, yeah, the, the, the scriptures are very similar. That even confuses me. Um, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries, whither I have driven them away, and they shall dwell in their own land. So, you know, when something's mentioned like that, you know, by the same prophet twice, in the exact same way, it's like, you've got to listen. You know, this is going to happen, and this hasn't and, happened yet. And remember the north country, Assyria? Yeah. You know, and then from Assyria, scattered throughout the entire world to the four corners? Yeah. You know, exactly. it, 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 it's come full circle. Mm. Because, yeah, he says, well, you know, from the land of the north and from all the lands where they have driven them. So they go up to the north, to Assyria, and then boom, to the rest of the world, to the four yeah. corners. Um, and, you know, the church used to know this as well. You know, bef you know, before they went, you know, fully apostate, as was prophesied to happen in many places, Second Thessalonians 2, First uh, Timothy 4, and Second Timothy 3, as well as Daniel 11, um, to name a few. Um, they, you know, they used to have that hymn from Isaiah, from Isaiah uh, 51, verse 11. Therefore the de redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Now, if you, you know, listen to the hymn, they, you know, they say heads, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. But the scripture is head, singular, because they become like one man. You know, it's, yeah, man. it's one entity. Yeah. Uh, and this is like the second exodus is a big topic to study out, you know. Um, there's a lot of scripture on it, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a bit more like a, a, a meaty topic, whereas we're trying to put across the milk for the lost sheep. Um, so we won't go into any more about that. But, I mean, I, I think um, we can just leave it at that, just as making a mention that there is a second exodus so great that the first one won't even be mentioned um and it hasn't happened yet and it has to happen it absolutely has to happen so um yeah i mean many called few chosen right that's that's it yep what do you guys think anything else to add yeah. i just i just pray that um this video finds the way into the lost sheep sands or this document and that they have ears to hear mm -hmm. yeah. that yeah, uh, Yah's will be done that his yeah. kingdom come the summary of you know every watchman's video should be the same you know time is short repent and obey the holy covenants yeah you amen know, that's 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 the only thing that we should be talking about you know and obviously everything we've mentioned you know this has been well, almost three hours you know but to summarize you know repent obey the holy covenants yeah that's it that's what we're doing this for 
and say also if you again if you made it to this point if you watched the whole thing you have been called you know you know you're no longer ignorant you have a duty to search out these matters and then share it with the rest of the world and um you know then it shows you something you've got to shout it from the rooftops so it's yeah. no coincidence if you made it three hours into a low production video like this you know um like that you, it means you, you're you're a lost sheep and you've been called and you need it you know but will you be chosen you know you decide on that you have to keep you know keep the ten commandments the rainbow covenant and you'll do well amen all right guys amen. i'll put the links and everything in that's needed in the description so check the description for all the resources the links to the other videos the photos the documents everything like that Thank you, brothers. No problem. Thank you. Crazy, yeah.